I'm Carolyn Osuyos with ElderWorks. I'm the newest team member here, having been around for a little over two and a half years. I cover the Northwest suburbs as well as our social service clients today. And I hope you're here to hear about demystifying gold and silver. I'd like to introduce our presenter, David Kaz. He's the president and precious metal buyer at DMK Metal. While working as a bag boy at his grandparents' Rogers Park grocery store in the 70s, David was fascinated by the silver dimes, quarters, half dollars, and war nickels that would appear in the cash register. He exchanged the modern versions for the silver change, and that started his 40 plus year interest in silver and gold. He has been actively purchasing unwanted gold and silver items from clients at the highest prices for the past five years and enjoys educating his clients on the value of gold and silver jewelry, sterling flatware, coins and more. And on a personal note, I just wanna mention that in preparation for this presentation, I talked to David last week about our national chain shortage and the fact that most of us do have loose coins in our homes. And he educated me on a few things to look for. And I have to say, I was pleasantly surprised to find a number of coins sitting around our house actually have a, a value far more than their face. So with that, let me have David take it away. Um, he has asked that we wait until the end for questions. So please do use the chat and the Q&A. And um, here you go, David Cass. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you so much, Carolyn. Thank you, Jennifer, and the whole ElderWorks team for uh, having me present. So I'm going to jump right in. Uh, my presentation is called Demystifying Gold and Silver. And uh, it's got a lot of information, got some good conspiracy theories for you. Hopefully it's uh, interesting and, and entertaining and love to answer questions as we go. Or actually at the end. So uh, put them in the chat and I'll answer them at the end of the presentation. So I call it demystifying gold and silver because, and I, I'm going to use the word gold, not always saying gold and silver, because gold has had sort of a mystical, mysterious uh, feeling to it for thousands of years. So gold... The word uh, orum is the Latin word for gold, comes from the word yellow. Uh, the Egyptians who first used gold uh, over 5,000 years ago believed gold came from the sun ra god known as Ra. And uh, interestingly enough, gold is formed by the explosion of a supernova. So it does come from a star, just not from our star, the sun. Uh, one of the terms for gold is God's money. And you'll hear me use money a lot in this presentation. Gold and silver are truly money. Uh, but it's first mentioned, it's mentioned in the Bible uh, hundreds of times, both gold and silver. Uh, first, you know, in the first book in Genesis, uh, a lot of us remember the, the Charlton Heston and the Ten Commandments. Uh, there was the golden calf, there was the Ark of the Covenant, where the, uh, the tablets went in, were uh, both made of gold. Uh, one of the wise uh, men gifts to Jesus was gold. And then if you look at artwork throughout history, uh, you'll see that the halo is only, always depicted as gold. So gold has this mysterious, mystical, otherworldly, religious feeling to it. Uh, the Catholic Church has amassed gold for thousands of years, and almost all religions use gold in their symbology, jewelry, uh, chalices, statues, art, architecture, many objects that have to do with uh, ceremonies and uh, burials, and that's been going on for thousands of years. So that's kind of the mys mystical side. So let's bring it down a little bit to earth. So what is gold? Gold is actually an element, so you'll find it on the periodic table. Right there in the middle, you see all of the um, precious metals. So you've got platinum, palladium, iridium, rhodium, gold, silver. Of all the precious metals, gold is the only one that's yellow. All the other ones are silver or white. Now, there are four, uh, four precious metals that you could buy from an investment perspective, and they're weighed in troy ounces. And the troy ounce is slightly more, about 10% heavier than a regular ounce. So uh, they're, they're termed troy ounces. When you buy one ounce of gold, it's a, actually one troy ounce. And uh, you can see here the density. And what's really kind of interesting is if you look at the density of gold next to silver, it's almost double the density. 
And in the upper right-hand corner, you see two one ounce coins. Those are both, uh, there's a, a silver eagle and a gold eagle. They weigh the exact the same amount. And yet the silver coin is almost double the size of the gold because gold is so much more dense. Now of these four uh, precious metals, you could buy them all uh, at, from an investment perspective, but only gold and silver historically have been used as money. So they're known as the monetary metals. Uh, gold has very special properties. Uh, there's a lot of reasons that gold has value. It's valued in and of itself. It has intrinsic value. Uh, it's a bright yellow metal, very, uh, people find it beautiful. Uh, it's got a, a shiny gold luster to it. It's the most ductile of all materials out there. It can beat it into those uh, sheets of gold leaf that you see a photo there. It's a very thin layer, almost paper thin of gold. And that's a lot of what uh, artists would lay over a frame, a picture frame, if they had gold on it, or even a big dome like St. Peter's Dome might have gold on it. Uh, so you'd use that uh, gold leaf. Uh, gold is the most malleable of all met metals. So it can be bent, shaped into anything. You could take a one ounce gold coin and stretch it into a wire a mile long. It's that malleable. Gold and silver are the most con uh, electrically conductive and heat conductive metals. So they're used uh, widely in electrical purposes as well as heat. Uh, gold can be dissolved in acid, so it's soluble, it's scarce. That's another reason gold is valuable, it's scarcity. So it's very hard to find, but you can find it on every continent. And that's one of the reasons it makes for good money, because you can find it everywhere. It's corrosion resistant. Uh, if anybody knows the story of Mel Fisher, who used to dive looking for sunken ships, uh, he found the Atosha. They went down, found just millions and millions of dollars of gold coins. They were just as shiny at as they were when, the, when that ship sunk hundreds of years ago. So gold is corrosion resistant, it doesn't oxidize. Silver, as a lot of us know, tarnishes, whereas gold does not. Um, and it's highly dense, like I showed in that, in that last slide. So a little bit about the gold and silver supply. So historically, uh, prospectors, miners, those that were searching for gold would, would increase the gold supply by about 5% per year and gold was used as money. The population across the uh, globe used to increase by about 5% per year. So that therefore the quantity of money coming out of the ground kept up with the population increase. And that was historically, that's not the same uh, case today. A very highly producing gold mine, you would find one small gram of gold for every ton of rock. So you need to blow up a lot of rock, dig miles down into the earth, pull up a ton of rock to find just one gram of gold. And that's in a highly producing mine. Silver is a little different. Silver, it, there's very few dedicated silver mines out there. Silver is usually more of a byproduct when you're mining for lead, copper, gold, other metals, you find silver at the same time. Uh, almost every ounce of gold that's been mined is still in existence in jewelry, in coins, in bars. Um, however, almost every ounce of silver that's ever been mined has been used up, is sitting in landfills and garbage dumps. Uh, it's never been recycled, and I'll get into that a little bit later. Uh, mining equates to about 75% of the gold supply annually, and about uh, recycling, which is what my business does, recycling is about 10% of the gold supply. Um, coming out of the earth today, there's about nine ounces of silver for every one ounce of gold. Historically, the ratio was closer to 15 to 1 coming out of the ground. And in value today, it's about 80 to 1, 80 ounces of silver to every one ounce of gold from value. But coming out of the ground, it's 9 ounces of silver for every one ounce of gold. All right, so let's, let's do a little bit of history on gold and silver. So uh, the Egyptians were the first to discover and use gold about 5,000 years ago. I would say that almost every war that's been fought Every uh, time that an, an imperialist country took over another country, it was primarily for their gold. Gold was and always has been money. So when countries went to war, a lot of times they would enslave people, but the main thing they were doing was trying to get their resources. Gold was the resource of exchange of wealth of money. So Egypt, uh, as I mentioned, believed that it came from the sun, uh, sun god named Ra. And it was actually mined along the River Nile. Um, now they created jewelry. If anybody went to the Museum of Science and Industry a few years back, uh, you saw King Tut's tomb was made out of gold. So they used it for a lot of their symbology. And they were the first to actually use money as a means of exchange, but they didn't actually create coins. They had what were known as grains 
of gold, just you know, little lumps, or they had nuggets, and they could exchange it for goods, and yet they didn't truly use, they didn't coin it, but using it as a means of exchange may, means that it was money. The first country to ever coin money was a country called Lydia, which is no longer around. It was part of Asia Minor, which is now Turkey. So they were the first, and you, if you look at the first picture at the top of my slide, that was actually uh, one of the original gold coins. And then next to that, you see a gold coin from China. So China used gold as money, you know, hundreds of years ago. And China, ironically, was the first country to ever use, uh, create paper money, uh, kind of the bane to all of our existence these days. And I'll explain more. Uh, Greece created jewelry and coins. Uh, the Roman Empire, very interesting, as the Roman Empire fell, they were conquering nations. They had this massive army. The citizens of uh, Rome did not want to pay taxes for war. So what the, uh, the leaders in uh, Rome did is they created, they added base metals to their coins. So their coins were gold and silver. They added copper. And eventually the coins turned to bronze, which had no value because there's no gold or silver. And they call that debasing the currency by adding base metals. Uh, European countries, they would, uh, you know, the Spanish, the Portuguese would go across the seas. They went, you know, the Spanish went to Central and South America. They were actually looking for gold, but they found more silver than gold. So a lot of the world's silver still comes from South America and Central America. And then before the U.S. Uh, was established, when we were still colonies, we used the Spanish Real, also known as a piece of eight. And uh, it actually could be cut into eight small pieces. So they didn't have dimes, quarters, halves, and full dollars. So it was a piece of eight that could be very easily clipped into little pie shapes in order to make change when you were exchanging. So before we had a dollar in the U.S., before we were the U.S., we used the Spanish Real primarily. All right, so let's get into uh, more of the history of gold and silver in the U.S. So uh, the colonies, as we were uh, declaring our uh, independence and writing the Constitution, of course, Thomas Jefferson was one of the main writers of the Constitution, and he wrote in uh, 1784 what would become the Coinage Act in 1792 added to the U.S. Constitution. And in the, in the Coinage Act, it actually explained that a silver dollar was 371.25 grains of silver, and that was because that was the Spanish Real's content. So he just took what the Real was, made that the same weight of silver in the dollar. And then he also defined what a $10 gold piece or an eagle would weigh. And if you look in the upper right corner of my slide, a silver dollar from 1935 and before was about three quarters of an ounce of silver. Whereas an eagle, a $10 gold coin had almost exactly a half ounce of gold. And the double eagle coin, had very close to one ounce of gold. So whenever we get to the point where we talk about it being 15 to one, it'll make a little bit more sense knowing that there was only three quarters of an ounce of silver in a silver dollar. All right, so the original uh, ratio, the gold to silver ratio in the constitution was 15 to one. So 15 ounces of silver for every one ounce of gold. In 1834, it changed to 16 to one. And as I mentioned earlier, there, it's really about nine, nine to one out of the earth. Uh, in 1776, when we did, uh, when we were fighting the Revolutionary War against Britain, uh, we created the Continental, which was paper currency. And uh, paper currencies actually goes against the Constitution. But again, we're fighting a war. What did governments do? They would print money because the citizens really don't like war. They don't like to give tax money for war. So they created what was called the Continental. And eventually that paper currency went to zero value. And there was a phrase called not worth a continental. That's where it came from. It was the continental dollar that went to zero. Uh, in 1791, Hamilton went against the Constitution right out of the gates and created what was known as the first bank of the U.S. And we are not supposed to have a central bank, according to the uh, Constitution. We're not supposed to have paper currency. But sure enough, he created um, uh, the first bank, which uh, then was put, uh, put to rest in 1811. Very shortly after, in the 20s, uh, there was the second bank of the U.S. created. And in 1836, Andrew Jackson actually killed the bank. And supposedly his dying words on his deathbed were, I killed the bank. And so that's one of Andrew Jackson's claims to fame. Uh, historically, paper currency, uh, when you had private banks, they would issue a receipt for your gold that was deposited in the bank. So a paper, a paper dollar, a paper $20 bill printed by a bank was a receipt that when you gave that paper uh, a receipt to someone, they could go claim your gold that was stored at the bank in the vault. 
So that's how dollars, you know, bills were originally created was just a receipt against gold and silver. Um, in 1848, gold was discovered in California. And then now we had a huge number of prospectors that moved out West. The biggest influx of them was in 1849. So the San Francisco, uh, San Francisco 49ers got their name from those prospectors called the 49ers. In uh, 1861, we were fighting the um, uh, Civil War. And again, people didn't want to give their gold for, to fight a war. So Lincoln created what were known as the greenbacks. And the greenbacks, you'll see actually a picture over here, the, uh, the second to the bottom, they quickly went to zero in value as well. So paper currency has a history uh, throughout all of history, hundreds of years uh, since the Chinese first created paper money of going to its intrinsic value, which is the value of the paper, which is zero. Uh, from 1870 to 1971, our paper currency, whether it was created by the treasury or by uh, individual banks or by uh, really eventually the Federal Reserve, which I'll talk about more, was backed by the gold in Fort Knox. So in 1910, uh, a group of bankers, which included Paul Warburg representing Nathaniel Rothschild, and the Rothschild family is the sort of the, I don't, I don't you know, if you, if you, uh, hear a little bit about uh, the bankers as criminals. You know, the Rothschilds actually own the central banks across the globe, not just the Federal Reserve. So Paul Warburg was there representing the Rothschilds. Uh, J.P. Morgan was not there, but he had a representation. So six bankers, one New York senator took a trip south to uh, Georgia, and they went out to an island called Jekyll Island. And they came up with an idea of creating the third bank of the U.S. to be able to have control over printing paper currency, again, against the Constitution. So you can buy a book called Creature from Jekyll Island. It's about 600 pages, and we'll give you way more history than I'm giving you right now, especially around uh, the, the creation of the Federal Reserve. So in 1910, they devised the scheme. It's a collusion of banks. And in 1913, Woodrow Wilson passed the Federal Reserve Act. The same year he passed the IRS Act. So the IRS, the Internal Revenue Service, and the Federal Reserve were both approved by Woodrow Wilson in 13, and they were both worked hand in hand and have worked hand in hand since 1913 to take our money. So we never had uh, income tax until 1913 in the United States. Uh, fast forward a little bit to 1933, FDR is president, we're in the depths of a depression, and FDR came up with the New Deal, didn't work, came up with the new New Deal, was not working, had all kinds of programs, was doing all kinds of infrastructure projects. The country was really hurting. And he came up with a plan to bring in all the gold. And he actually made gold coins illegal, believe it or not, in the United States. So in 1933, the citizens were instructed, and you can see over here on the right-hand side, he passed an executive order saying that you needed to turn in your gold coins for paper dollars. So if you had a $20 gold piece, you know, it wasn't stolen from you. They gave you a $20 bill. That $20 bill was still based on the gold being in the in Fort Knox. And yet, once he sucked in most of the gold coins out there, he revalued gold from $20 an ounce, where it had been since 1791, to $35 an ounce. And by doing that, he was able to fund a lot of programs and also confiscated 75% of the wealth of the citizens of the United States. 1944, we're in the World War II, and uh, there was this need for international trade. There were countries in Europe that were, you know, being torn apart through bombing raids. And so uh, there was representatives from all over the world. The Allied nations came to a town called Brenton Woods in New Hampshire, and they came up with the Brenton Woods Agreement, which established the U.S. dollar as the reserve currency of the world. And what that meant is for international trade, from 19, starting in 44, you needed to use dollars if you wanted to buy products or commodities between nations. So if you were in France and you wanted to buy Spanish olives, you needed to convert your French francs into U.S. dollars to send to Spain. Now, why is that? Why was the U.S. dollar as good as gold? Well, it's because all these countries shipped their gold to us as their countries were exploding, because Germany and other countries and Austria wanted to take everybody's gold. That's what war a big part of war is, is taking other countries' wealth, which is their goal. So a lot of countries ship their gold to us to store in Fort Knox. And now we said that the U.S. dollar is redeemable uh, for gold. If you, Mr. Uh, foreign Country, send us our dollars back, we'll send you your gold back. 
So that was the promise. That's why the US dollar became the reserve currency of the world. And it still is today, but there's lots of countries that have gone around it or tried to, and we end up going to war with them when they try to go around the reserve currency. In 1963, JFK, who was a huge fan of gold and silver, uh, probably more so silver for various reasons, uh, came out with an executive order to keep silver in the currency and actually back the currency by silver uh, and uh, silver stored by the US government. And shortly after passing that executive order, he was assassinated. I'm not saying he was assassinated because he wanted to keep silver, but there is um, there are some conspiracy theories out there that he was going against the central bank, against the Federal Reserve. Part of that was keeping silver in our currency. And shortly after he was killed, um, they put his face on the half dollar. I've got one here, a Kennedy half, which are still in circulation today. And 1964 was the last year that U.S. coins, dimes, quarters, half dollars, were 90% silver. And then from 1965 through 1970, and Carolyn was talking about this earlier, from 1965 to 1970, half dollars were actually 40% silver, but there was zero silver in dimes and quarters after 1964. Now, fast forward a little bit to 1971. Uh, LBJ uh, passed a lot of social programs. The country was printing, well, the Fed was printing and printing money. Uh, we had it set up where Fort Knox, the gold in Fort Knox was still backing the dollar, but what was originally 100% of the dollars were uh, transferable into gold. By this point, it was down to 10%. The dollar was only backed by 10% gold, uh, so 90% was unbacked, was, uh, was basically fiat currency. Uh, but what was happening in, seven, in the early 70s, we had the Vietnam War, we had social programs, we were spending money like crazy, printing and the Fed was printing money, buying bonds, getting money into circulation. And France, Charles de Gaulle picked up the phone and called the US and said, hey, I want all my gold back. And uh, as a lot of you might know, Charles de Gaulle, there was an assassination attempt on him. I'm not saying who, who, who did that uh, attempt, but then what Nixon did, and there's a famous speech and uh, I have the video actually queued up where Nixon took us off the gold standard and he said it was temporary, but we are still off the gold standard. So we are still in that temporary mode of being fully off of gold. And the US dollar, the currency in your pocket is what is known as fiat currency. It's backed by decree by the government saying it has value, but it's truly not backed by anything. Uh, just an aside, we call it the petrodollar. And that's because if you needed to use dollars to exchange for commodities, the biggest commodity to exchange globally is oil. So it's called the petrodollar because it's used between countries to buy and sell oil as the no a number one commodity. And if countries didn't want to use the dollar, we tended to go to war with them. Um, U.S. citizens, as I mentioned, FDR outlawed buying gold coins in 33. 1975, we were allowed to buy gold coins. Most people back then would buy Krugerrands if they bought anything. Now, if you see the pictures in the, on the right-hand side of my slide, uh, there's a gas station there uh, in 1964. And if you can squint and see, it says 25 cents a gallon. So back in 1964, a gallon of gas cost 25 cents. Now, if you had a silver quarter in that change that Carolyn was talking about at home right now, I would buy that coin for about five bucks. So not only is gasoline not more expensive at, at $2 a gallon today, it's way cheaper. So if you converted your silver quarter, which you, you would have used back then, today to paper currency, I'd give you five bucks. You could buy two gallons of gas, which would have gotten you only one gallon of gas back in 64. So it looks like it's way more expensive, but that's known as, uh, that's caused by inflation. Inflation is the increasing of the monetary base by the Federal Reserve, printing and printing money. More money means they're worth less. So therefore the price of goods go up. And there's a candy bar wrapper, 10 cents for a candy bar, which would cost you over a buck today. Same exact story. So the more dollars that are out there, the more we moved away from silver, the more things are seem more expensive. But in silver and gold terms, they're actually cheaper. All right, so who are some of the enemies of gold that I covered? So you've got Alexander Hamilton, and it's because he started now, he liked gold and he wanted the dollar back by gold forever, but he started the first bank in the US, which led us eventually to the Fed. And not only that, they created this play about Hamilton, and now my mom and my uh, mother in law both like rap music. So there's a double negative on Alexander Hamilton, not my favorite. Um, Woodrow Wilson, I'm, who I mentioned, passed the uh, IRS and the Federal Reserve Act of 1913. Uh, you see some of the bankers there, J.P. Morgan, Nathaniel Rothschild. Now, J.P. Morgan said gold is money, everything else is credit. So he liked gold. He just didn't necessarily like it for the people. 
FDR, who confiscated gold in 33, LBJ, who took us uh, off of silver, uh, Nixon, who took us off the gold standard, John Maynard Keynes, one of the most, uh, probably the most famous economists, and I think he, uh, uh, for bad reasons in my book, uh, but he called gold a barbarous relic, and he was there at Bretton Woods helping to establish the U.S. dollar as the world reserve currency, and then you got Ben Bernanke, who represents the Fed chairman, uh, he's, you know, a couple chairmen ago, but uh, he was asked by Ron Paul uh, during a session with Congress, you know, why do central banks still buy gold? And what did Bernanke say? He didn't say it's because it's money. He said it's because of tradition. So enemies of gold. Now, who are some of the heroes of gold? So you got Thomas Jefferson, who wrote the Coinage Act, Andrew Jackson, who famously killed the second bank of the U.S., uh, Ludwig von Mises, who's a, from the Austrian School of Economics, who believes strongly in gold and silver as money. The Libertarian Party got its founding in uh, the Austrian School of Economics. Ayn Rand, who was also a follower of the, of the Austrian School. Kennedy, a big fan of silver, as I mentioned. Now, Alan Greenspan, I have a question mark because in 1969, he wrote a great paper you can look up on the internet on the gold standard and why it was so critical to tie the dollar to gold because it, it basically puts handcuffs on government spending. If the government can only spend the money that they get in taxation based on the gold, and they can't spend beyond the gold in reserves, they can't spend like, like crazy. Unfortunately, that's not how things have progressed. And Greenspan, when he was Fed chairman, actually reduced rates to zero, led to the housing bubble, led to the NASDAQ bubble. So I put a question mark because he was a hero of gold, but also a villain of gold. Ron Paul, a uh, famous libertarian, big fan of gold and silver. You can see lots of videos from him. We've got a golden-haired president who shall go nameless, but the first one of the first things he did was put Andrew Jackson's portrait up in the Oval Office. So some would say that one of the main things he's doing is trying to kill the, the Federal Reserve, the bank. And then recently, uh, that same president appointed Judy Shelton to the Federal Reserve Board. That's Judy Shelton's picture. And uh, Judy Shelton is a famous uh, gold bug and quite uh, a big believer in the dollar backed by gold. And so if she actually gets, she just got approved by the Senate House uh, Finance Committee. And if she gets approved to be on the Federal Reserve Board, we'll see what happens in the not too distant future. All right, so I, I, you've heard me use the word uh, money as it relates to gold, which might sound strange. And when we talk about the U.S., the dollar, the paper dollar, $20 bill, $100 bills, we should look at that as currency. So there's one major difference between money and currency. So both money and currency are means of, of exchange. You can use them to buy goods. They both are a, a unit of account. You can actually measure them. Uh, they're durable, although I would say that paper currency is not nearly as durable as even, you know, coined money, even if it's not made out of gold and silver, of course, it's not as durable, but money is durable. Uh, they're divisible. You can break money and currency into smaller units. They're portable. You can carry money and currency in your pocket. They're fungible, meaning they're interchangeable. And uh, I like the idea of you know, well, actually, let me do the next one and I'll explain. So the big difference between money and currency is a store of value. So if in 1913 or 1933, you buried in your backyard five $20 gold coins, right? $100 of gold, and you'd buried $101 bills in your backyard. Now you dig them up today. That those $101 bills, if they weren't eaten by worms, are still only worth $100. Those gold coins, those five gold coins are worth over $9,000 based on where gold is today. So gold, money is a store of value. It has intrinsic value. It has value in and of itself, whereas currency is only a representation of money or it, or it should be. And if it's fiat currency, that means there's nothing backing it. There's no gold. There's no silver. It's not like we have all this oil sitting around that's backing the petrodollar. So uh, that's the big difference is the store of value of money. That's one of the properties that's crucial. That's why the U.S. dollar today is currency. It's not money. All right, so historically, uh, uh, silver coins, dimes, quarters, halves, and silver dollars were 90% silver. And if you bought them today, uh, they are called junk silver. And it's not because they're junk. They're actually very valuable, but that's a, a, uh, a slang term for old silver coins. So when you go through all your coins laying around, before you bring them to a bank or bring them to a retailer, go through them and look at the dates and see if you've got any dimes, quarters, halves, and silver dollars before uh, 64 and before. Okay, so the silver dollars, they stopped creating them, you know, something like this. This is a Morgan silver dollar. These were created till uh, 1921. Then we 
created the peace dollar and the peace dollar stopped in 1935. So it wasn't until 1971 that the Eisenhower dollar was created with zero silver in it. Uh, so again, with the current coin shortage, look at your coins. Uh, gold coins were also 90% gold. So up until 1933, we had a very small $1 coin, gold coin, and it was smaller than a dime. So I don't know, it wasn't, didn't seem very practical, but there was a $1 gold coin smaller than a dime. There was a $2.5 gold coin, a $5. Uh, there was a $3 gold coin for a while and a $10 and a $20 gold coin. And today, uh, the U.S. Mint actually produces uh, eagles. So again, I got I have a picture here of a gold and silver eagle. And those are not coins in, in circulation, but those are used for investment purposes. One troy ounce of gold, one troy ounce of silver. And then other countries create uh, gold and silver coins as well. In Canada, it's the Canadian Maple Leaf. In Austria, it's the Philharmonic. In Australia, it's the uh, uh, kangaroo. Um, in China, it's the panda. So different countries create different, but the, the, the one ounce gold coin, whether it's produced in Austria, China, Japan, doesn't matter. One ounce of gold is worth the same in the US as, as, it, as it is in China. So when I talked about fungible, that was the thing I was gonna talk about before, it's interchangeable, right? For international trade, gold is the best because it's worth the same no matter where you are across the globe. All right, so here are two $20, uh, two $20 bills. So one on the left is created before 1933. And if you look at the bottom, it says in gold coin payable to the bearer on demand. So you could walk into any bank back at, you know, 33 and before with your $20 bill. That $20 bill printed by the Fed, again, outsourced the printing to the Fed, but it was still based on gold. And you could trade that $20 gold, that $20 bill for a gold coin. Now, the one today, uh, and since 1933, is called a Federal Reserve note. So what is a note? A note is a debt vehicle. So you are walking around today with, with debt, you know, pieces of debt in your wallet, in your purse, and with this $20 bill, you owe the Federal Reserve $20 plus interest. And the founders knew of that scheme, and the guys on Jekyll Island knew what scheme they were putting together. If we have the power to control the money, we can control the country. And that's a, that's a Rothschild quote. I might've got it wrong a little bit, but that's basically uh, where we are. All right, so a little excitement. Uh, I was hoping to have thousands of people at this presentation because gold, at least to me, I would look at it all day long every day, but it just hit an all-time high in July. So the, the previous all-time high was hit in, uh, in 2011 and it went all the way up to $1,920 in 2011. And it came meandered down between basically 1,050 to about 1,500 for the last eight years. In just a couple of weeks ago, it breached the 1920. And then uh, last week or the, maybe two weeks ago, it went above $2,000 per ounce. So kind of uh, interesting uh, timeliness for this presentation. So uh, from the writing of the Constitution, uh, the gold was at $20 an ounce. From 1934 to 1971, gold was 35 to 42 an ounce. It was re uh, balance a couple times in there to adjust for inflation, to adjust for social programs and wars. In 1975, when, uh, as I mentioned earlier, when the U.S. citizens were allowed to buy gold again, it went all the way up to $180. And people thought it was a massive bubble, right? Oh my God, it went up from $40 to $180, which is a huge increase. But then in 1980, gold went all the way up to $800 an ounce. And then if anybody was trying to buy a house in 1980 and you had to go get a 20% mortgage, it was very painful. So Paul Volcker, who was the federal chairman back then, raised interest rates up to 20%, or actually 18%. So you could buy a treasury and get a huge interest rate. You could retire, you can put a lot of money into treasuries and get a huge interest rate payment of you know, 16, 17%. And uh, that allowed the Fed to suck in a lot of the liquidity. So the printed dollars out there, um, uh, he was able to pull in and then gold was reduced down all the way down to $250. So from 1981 to 2001, gold ranged from $250 to $450. Um, it steadily rose into till 2010 when it finally breached 1,000 an ounce. And then in 2011, I mentioned it went to uh, 1920. And now here we are now. Today, it's below. I, I did a screen grab on Kitco where you can go at, all the time, guys. You can go to kitco.com to see the spot, the global price of gold and silver. But I did a screen grab right when it, it hit 2,000. So I think I hit the exact moment, which was kind of, kind of interesting. I was walking my puppy right when that happened. 
All right, so that's a lot of monetary. Uh, so let's get into some other uh, topics around gold and silver. So what are some of the uses beyond money? So of course, money and coins and bank reserves, but also uh, gold and silver have been used for medals and awards. Think about the Olympics, gold medals, silver medals. The Oscar is gold plated. He's never been 100% uh, pure gold, still valuable as a collector's item, but gold plated. Uh, military medals made out of silver. Uh, jewelry, of course, is the A number one use for gold and silver throughout history. Uh, so jewelry, uh, and I'll explain a little bit more how you figure out what your jewelry is worth. Uh, art and religious items I'd mentioned earlier, uh, dental. So dental gold is very good stuff. If you've got a crown, a bridge, a filling, uh, don't let your dentist keep it. You take it back. If you had a tooth pulled and it's got gold, you keep it. If it's silver, don't worry too much about it. But uh, gold is a very sturdy metal. Really, uh, gold teeth last for, for a long time. And uh, they're also, both gold and silver are used in electrical use. Every cell phone, every computer, if you look at a circuit board, you'll see gold-plated uh, contacts and you, there's silver wires throughout. So gold and silver are the best conductors of electricity. Now silver, why am, I, uh, why am I a bigger fan of silver than gold, especially from an investment perspective, is silver is the most useful of all metals. And I think it could be argued that it's the most useful of all elements on the periodic table. But uh, let's you know, take a step back. It's the most useful of all metals. So it is used in things like flatware, right? So sterling silver flatware. It's used for candlesticks, right? Here's a candelabra. Everybody's got these silver candelabras. It's used in serving pieces. It's used in salt and pepper shakers. So it's used for a lot of different things, you know, picture frames. Uh, in photography, now let's get to the, I, I'm not a, you know, uh, engineer by any uh, sense of the uh, stretch of the imagination, but it's used in photography to develop film. If you had a darkroom back in the days before the iPhone, uh, you needed uh, silver to, uh, to develop your photographs. You, it's silver is used in x-rays. The black that you see on that x-ray there, that is actually silver. Now, silver is the most reflective element. So every solar panel, as we move down this renewable energy path, every solar panel has a layer of silver on it, right? Mirrors, the reflective element of a mirror historically was a layer of silver behind the glass. For solar panels, it's silver. That is what allows them to reflect, absorb the light. Uh, silver is an antibacterial. So Under Armour brags that they have silver woven in their clothing as to prevent odors and it's, you know, an antibacterial. It's used in uh, medical purposes, in sutures, in ba uh, bandages post-operation. There's silver. It's an antibacterial. It's used for water filtration. Uh, silver solder for soldering together contacts, electrical contacts. If you go into an old industrial building and you see an electrical panel, all the contacts in there are silver. So it is the best conductor of electricity as well as of heat. Now, back to energy. Energy is the A number one reason that you might consider investing something in silver. Uh, it's used in nuclear energy. It's used in engine bearings. And most important, I think of all, is in batteries, right? When you have solar panels on your house, you can create energy while the sun's out. Well, what happens overnight? You're, cre you're not creating energy anymore, so you need a way to store it. How do you store it? If you have a Tesla, you've got batteries. If you've got a, a, um, a hybrid car, you've got big honking batteries in your, in, your, in your car. So silver, from what I understand, is the most critical element within batteries as we move forward. All right, so let's get down to the practical of how you identify your own items. So the first thing you want to do is get a very powerful battery, or I mean, uh, sorry, a uh, magnet. And uh, gold and silver do not stick to a magnet. They're not supposed to. Pure gold and silver definitely don't. But uh, when you're going through your jewelry box, looking at the gold items, if uh, first thing you might do is test it with a magnet. If it sticks very hard to a magnet, chances are very good it's not gold. Now here's a test. I've got a magnet. Uh, it's a little stick, a metal magnet that I'm using. You've got two gold necklaces side by side. They look identical. One's just thicker than the other. The one, uh, one of them six, sticks to the magnet. So I know just based on that test right there that it's not gold. The other one does not stick to the magnet. So now I've got a fighting chance. Now there's a chance it's gold. And here you see two earrings, same thing. So what else do you want to do? You want to get yourself a powerful magnifying glass or loop. And from a gold perspective, what are you looking for? All right, so here's just a little um, uh, math lesson. Get a, let's get back to fractions. So when it comes to gold, the denominator is 24. So think about it. 24 divided by 24 is 100%. So 24 karat gold is 100% gold. 
So 10 karat gold, you're going to look for 10K on your necklace, bracelet, your earring, or you look for the number 417. Because if you divide 10 by 24, you get 441.7% or 0.417. So 10 karat gold is 41.7% gold. 14 karat gold, 14 divided by 24 is 0.585. So on your jewelry, a lot of ladies know that you might see the number 585. That means it's 14 karat gold or 585 parts per thousand or 58.5% gold. 18 karat gold is 75% gold or 750. If you look at the picture, you see actually a piece of white gold that says 750. That means it's 18 karat. And again, it doesn't matter if it's white, it's still the same exact 75% gold. They just mixed in more platinum, palladium, rhodium, something else to turn it that silver or white color. So white gold, same exact gold content as gold, you know, yellow gold. Now, if you know, have any friends from India, or if you are yourself from India, you know that the gold is more yellow. That's actually 22 karat gold, which is 91.7% uh, 90, gold. So that gold might say 917 on it. And then, as I said, 24 karat gold, uh, there is gold jewelry that I've bought, uh, which came from, you know, South Korea, from China, you know, Asia, and it would say 999, 99.9% .9 gold. Now, silver is a little trickier. Looking at your silver jewelry, your silver items, you're looking really for two primary things. You're looking for the word sterling, right? So if you had some flatware, I'm going to hold, I don't think you'll be able to see it too well up on this camera, but it says sterling at the bottom of this says sterling camera. Uh, I'm not sure if it's focused. Um, so you're looking for the word sterling or you're working, looking for the number 925. So sterling silver is 92 and a half percent silver. That's what the 925 means. So on jewelry, a lot of jewelry says 925, a lot of flatware serving pieces, you know, candlesticks tend to say sterling. So that's what you're primarily looking for. Now there's some other things you might look for. Uh, you might see the word coin silver. I've seen uh, that I've bought a lot of watches that are silver and they say coin on them. And that means 90% silver. So just like coins in the US were made of 90% silver, coin silver means it's 90% silver. Now on antique silver, you might see numbers like 700, 800, 835, 900. That means 700 parts per thousand of silver, 800. Now this, this salt shaker, as I looked on the bottom of it, so it actually says 700 on it. So that means this is 700 parts per thousand or 70% silver. So it's not sterling, right? Sterling is 92 and a half, but it's still majority of silver. Now you're also looking for a hallmark. So if you don't see a number or the word sterling, you'll see a hallmark. So you see the middle picture I have on my slide. What you really want to see is that lion. So you see that lion profile and that lion is different in England than from Denmark than from Germany, but that lion represents sterling. And the other hallmarks, you might see the maker mark, who's the actually the guy who made the silver, where did it come from, the silver foundry. Uh, the last symbol where you see like a letter inside of a geometric shape, that actually is the date. So you can sell, tell what the date of the item is based on looking at that number. And there's all kinds of things that you can find online and there's books that you can buy. Now, the saddest thing you can see on, on silver, quote unquote silver, is when it's plated, right? Because plating means there's a very microscopic layer of silver on top of a base metal like copper or nickel. And so if you see EP, that means electroplated. If you see, and this I'm selling you on your flatware, on your can, any of your pieces, if you see EP electroplated, EPNS is electroplated nickel silver, EPBM electroplated over base metal, A1, silver over copper, community, triple plated, quadruple plated. I don't care if it's 10 plated, it's, it's still plated. It's not worth nearly what sterling is. And there is still a sum value, just very, very little. And most people have, unfortunately, a lot of plated stuff laying around, not as much sterling. It's much better if you have sterling. Now, here's a topic uh, called sterling weighted or reinforced, which if I showed you, if you could see the bottom of this one, it actually says sterling weighted or reinforced. And that means that this base down here has a, has a cement weight in it. And there's also a, uh, a metal rod throughout, Oop, a metal rod in here. Okay. So when I find a candlestick or like you see in that photo, usually it's going to be anywhere from 10 to 30% sterling and the rest is weight. So it's still good. It's still sterling. It's just not solid. The whole weight is not sterling. It's, uh, there's a big weight in there. So here I'm showing that before I took the candlestick apart, it weighed 9.3 ounces. Now you see that with a wire cutter, I'm peeling off that aluminum foil layer of sterling and there's a, a weight that brown under there is a weight. And then when I weigh that uh, sterling after taking it off, it's right around an ounce. 
So there you can see that I, it's, you know, give or take 10 to 20% of the weight was sterling. So a lot of people have these candlesticks laying around that say sterling weighted. That kind of gives you some insight in, into what that means. Hey, David, this is your five minute warning. Oh, geez. All right. So I'll go real quick. That, um, well, you know what? I, maybe I'll take a couple questions. Why don't I take a couple questions? If I Do I only have five minutes or do I have 15 minutes? You have five minutes, David. Uh, we have a little Do I have some questions, today. Jen, or, or are there really not any questions? There are. I don't know where Carolyn went, but yes. Um, let's see here. I'm if, right here, Jen. I hit the mute button. Okay, okay great. So the ask question, question is, if you find an old bill that says, in gold payable to the bearer, can it be exchanged for gold and for how much? Unfortunately, no longer. Uh, up until 1933, you could, but after that, no. Okay, wonderful. Someone else wanted to know if gold came from collision to earth, where is silver from? That's a good question. I think, uh, well, it's, it's more that the explosion of the supernova that created the earth, not that it came down and smacked into the earth. I, I believe it was the same explosion that really created everything. So that same, you know, original Big Bang, if you believe in the Big Bang theory, created every element in the ground, and you know, including silver and gold. All right, we have a comment that this is a fascinating presentation. And the next question is, how can you tell if something that is marked 925 is real not silver coated? Well, usually when it says 925, that's a great question. When it says 925, I usually believe it. And I'm gonna click through my slides as you are, as I'm answering, not that I, so that at least you see the rest of the presentation. Um, so if it says 925, I believe it all, all the time. However, there is a test. I bring with me an acid test kit or anybody like me where you scratch a little layer of silver onto a stone. And in order to get, if it's plated, you gotta scratch pretty deep. And then I put some acid on it that would actually change the color of it to blue. And then I know it's sterling. Another way I could do it is kind of cut into the item. So with a file, like on the bottom here, I could cut into it, put some acid on there. And if I see green and bubbly, then I know it's, it's plated. If, it do, if it's inert, if nothing happens, then I know it's the real deal. Wonderful. And someone else would like to know, how much will one gold coin from India sell for? Great question. So there's different denominations on coins from India. I don't, I don't know that they make a one ounce coin. So you'd have to go back and look at how many rupees it is. And based on, you know, you can look on online if it's, you know, hundred rupees, 50 rupees. I don't know the, the exact answer to that, but you should be able to find that online. That's what I would do and see how much of that coin. Usually those coins were 90% gold as well, just like the U S coins were. Uh, and you can see what percent is gold and you could weigh it or, or online you'd be able to find out how much how much gold it is. Great. And the next next question is interesting. There is an episode of the Twilight Zone where three men brought gold into the future thinking they would be rich and it was like garbage and worthless in the future. Could yeah. this happen here? Should have brought Tesla stock with them or maybe some Amazon stock. <laughs> um, Listen, gold and silver have had value for 5,000 years. They were historically used as money. Every central bank around the world buys gold, has it in storage as an asset, regardless of what Ben Bernanke said. I dare any guy to get married and not give his fiance a gold or a platinum ring. Maybe give her you know, some tungsten and see if she accepts your, prop your proposal. So I'm a strong believer that gold and silver will always have value. Now, Interestingly enough, silver, because of its industrial use, right? Gold is still mostly for its beauty, you know, coins and jewelry and bars, whereas silver, batteries, solar panels, antibacterial, it's getting used up in industry. So while silver may not have use as money in the future, even though I think it will, uh, it's always going to have use industrially. So I would say bring some gold, but bring, you know, maybe, uh, listen, you could have brought GE stock with you, right? Thinking you had a home run and GE stock went down almost zero. So I would say bring some gold. It's not a bad idea into the future with you. All right. We've got a couple more questions coming in. Someone would like to know if gold sales are taxable. Oh, that's a great question. So I'm not, uh, I'm not a financial planner. I had a slide here on how to invest, which I'm sorry, I wasn't able to go into detail, but at least I used the slide. Um, from what I understand, 
if you sell over ten thousand dollars of gold uh it is taxable uh, you know ten thousand in profit so if you can show the basis of a hundred dollars per ounce and you sold it for two thousand an ounce from what i understand you're taxed uh, on the on the profitability now here's something and again i'm not an accountant you talk to your own accountant from what i understand you could trade like for like and i like this idea of a gold trade and i do this with some of my clients i don't really sell the stuff but i buy it um if you sold some gold jewelry and turned right around and bought gold gold coins i believe it's a non-taxable event uh, there's another thing that you might want to check with your accountant is if you uh, want to make a charitable donation there's some advantages to donating gold coins which can be offset i guess against your your income so definitely not an accountant but um i do believe it is taxable when you on the profits at least today now there's a couple of states that i think have made it not taxable i think utah is one in texas but check you know check the internet don't don't count on me anything i shared with you you might want to do some uh, deeper research on your own but uh i believe it is taxable yes uh when it's over All right. profit we have two more questions we've got two minutes the question is, what do we need to know to sell our gold or silver items to get a fair price? And, and maybe that is contacting you, David. I would say, you know, definitely uh, contact me or someone that you know is uh, very reputable. Uh, like, um, like Carolyn said at the start, I do like educating as I go. So if I sit down with someone, I go through all their items. I separate it out by uh, costume, sterling, 10K, 14K, 18K. I explain the value as I go. It's very important that you separate out your gold into the different carat, right? So if 18 carat is 75%, as, as I explained, 75% gold, the same, an item of the same weight that's 10 carat is worth half. So nobody should ever group all your gold together and say, oh, I'll give you $1,000. They should separate your gold into carat, weigh it separately, and even show you, you know, based on gold being worth $2,040 today per ounce, I'm paying you this percent of the value of your gold. So yeah, definitely anybody can call me, email me, text me. You can see at the bottom of the screen, my email address, my cell phone number, any questions you have, I'm available all the time. Uh, you can send me photos of items if you like, I can tell you what it is. Uh, I, one of my big advantages, I go and meet people where it's most convenient. I can meet at your home, your backyard, I can meet at your lawyer's office. I can meet at your bank. So again, uh, when you're selling, and I did have a slide. Let me just go back real quick. All right, so here, this slide kind of answers that question as well. So I kind of gave you this slide, but in that uh, response to the question. Okay, um, I think we're gonna wrap. There is one last question on the wheat penny, the copper yeah. penny. Maybe you could, uh, that'll be the last one to leave them with. Is that on those uh, steel pennies or is that just pennies? No, this is the wheat penny value. It's a okay. copper penny. So copper, up until 1982, uh, pennies were made out of copper. So if you have uh, pennies that are 1982 and earlier, based on where copper is today, they're worth about uh, 1.8 cents. <laughs> so they're worth almost double. Back when copper was four bucks a pound, they were worth three cents a piece. Uh, that was a few years back. Uh, pennies there's a couple scarce ones the 1909 vdb so if you have a 1909 that might have a lot of value otherwise you know you'd have to have maybe some error coins you know coins that were struck strangely but i don't really deal with copper i'm only about the gold and the silver and when i buy coins like these i know i'm down to the last second i'm buying on them for their silver content i'm not buying them for their numismatic uh value so numismatic means that the year is rare or the coin is of high quality, collectible, I'm buying it for the silver content, not the collectability. So with wheat pennies, there's only a couple that might be collectible. Well, that's great, David. I'm sure you're gonna be getting some calls or emails. There's a lot of interest in this subject.